Hello and welcome to my garden. My name is Jolene and today's video is a bit different than my normal content. You're in for a treat. This is Liam, my son. <laughs> the video you're about to see is a very special one. Um, my father, David Stottlemyre, um, gave lectures around the country on gardening with the beginner gardener in mind. I grew up traveling around the country, mostly on the West Coast, um, listen, listening to my dad give this uh, seminar series. And my sister and I heard them so many times that we always said we could recite them by heart because we just, we knew where all his jokes were. We knew where, you know, the different things he said. And um, so it holds a really special place in my heart. Finally, after many years of him giving these lectures, um, he put these lectures into a five-part DVD series, and that's what you're watching today, one part of the series. Sadly, my dad passed to his rest in 2013 um, after a four-year battle with thyroid cancer. To honor his legacy, our family has decided to release this five-part DVD series onto YouTube for anyone to access and glean from his knowledge. If you would like to own this five-part DVD series, um, then email me in the description down below. I have my email address down there and we'd be happy to mail you one for the price of $24.99, which includes the shipping and the cost of the DVD. We hope you're blessed by this seminar. So we're going to talk about soil fertility, and here's a verse from the Bible that I like. Uh, he took also the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field, and he placed it by great waters and set it as a willow tree. So even in the biblical times, they understood what good soil was versus poor soil. And it was planted in a good soil by great waters that it might bring forth branches, and that it might bear fruit, that it might be a goodly vine. This verse, I believe, is talking about uh, a foreign nation. I don't know if it was Babylon, but one of these other nations. And uh, God was saying he's giving them an opportunity. He's placing them in a situation where they can thrive. It's the same way with our garden. We need to have good soil in our garden for the plants to thrive. Give them the opportunity to be a good plant. You've got to start with good soil. Soil fertility, this is uh, the garden we had in California for my girls. Uh, they had a little teepee back there with uh, vines growing on it and uh, various different flowers, a little chair. You can make the garden something enjoyable. Uh, you can go out and uh, just enjoy the flowers and things. The gardening doesn't have to be difficult. Make it a nice place. Some of the topics we're going to cover in this section, the basics of soil fertility. Difference between chemical and organic fertilizers, and this is the question that comes up. What's the difference between a chemical and an organic fertilizer? So we'll talk about the difference and the ramifications of using both or either. Soil pH and composting. So this is where we're heading, and we're going to talk first about the basics of soil fertility. So the basics, what are the plant nutrients? And then what are some nutrient deficiency symptoms? How do I find out what my soil needs? And that talks about soil testing. And then how to read a fertilizer label. So that's where we're going in this first little part. So the plant nutrients, they fall into either two or three groups, depending upon which book you read. First group is called your primary or macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And it's always in that order. It's that way on the... Uh, Fertilizer bags, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And then you have your secondary nutrients. In general, these are needed in lesser amounts, which is why they're called secondary nutrients. Calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. <coughs> Excuse me. Then you have your trace or your micronutrients. Now, some, some people will group these two together. But your trace or micronutrients are boron, iron, zinc, molybdenum, Manganese, copper, chlorine. By the way, chlorine was the last one found to be necessary by the plants because when they were trying to determine what plants need the essential nutrients, chlorine is so hard to get out of the environment. It's so pervasive. Chlorine is everywhere, it seems like, that they had difficulty getting it out of the soil. You know, they would find soil that didn't have any chlorine in it. They had a lot of trouble doing that just to determine that the plant needed it but they were able to determine that the plants need just a small amount of chlorine. 
Okay, here's some uh, nutrient deficiency symptoms. First of all, nitrogen is used in the growing part of the plant. And nitrogen, the plant can move it around. If it needs it, it could draw it from one place and use it somewhere else. Therefore, when you see the deficiency symptoms, it'll be in the older part of the plant because the plant will actively take nitrogen out of the old part and move it to the newer part where it needs it most. So a, a poor picture here, but on the left you have a normal tomato and on the right, these lower leaves are, are yellowish because the plant has pulled nitrogen out of those leaves and used them in the growing part. And here you can see a leaf where the plant has pulled the nitrogen out of the leaf and you get this little yellowish out of the tips of the leaf. And these would be the older leaves. Your phosphorus is used in flowering and fruiting. So if the part of the plant that you're uh, interested in is a fruit or a flower, cauliflower, things like that, this is a very important nutrient. The deficiency is dull green leaves or purple leaves. And I've had people ask me, well, I don't know what a dull green leaf looks like. Well, you have to be able to see a healthy leaf to know if the leaf is dull. But they do lo lose their healthy look to them. So if you've worked with plants very much and you start seeing this kind of a dull look to them, you might be having a problem with phosphorus. Now, the purple is really obvious. And I think here's, here it shows the purple. And here's a corn in a field where there's the purple. I, I uh, ran a greenhouse, and I turned all the tomato plants purple in that greenhouse by accident. I was, we had to feed them nutrient solution. You know, there was like a hydroponic type setup, and I forgot the phosphorus. And I walked in there one day, and I mean, just like in the period of two or three days, those plants had all turned purple. And I mean, they were, it was real obvious. And here I had all these students come in, and Mr. David, you turned all these, Plants purple. <laughs> Oops, mistake. And then it stayed that way for a while. So, you know, here, your sins will find you out. And continue and continue and continue. Did you add phosphorus after that? Oh, I, I remember. I got really good at remembering phosphorus after that. Yeah. But I mean, to that same plant, did you? You could give them phosphorus, but the purple remains for a while, at least. Potassium is used in the seed and root development. The deficiency symptom is mottled yellow leaves. Now there's a couple other ones that'll do the same mottling look. And you could also get burned leaf tips from potassium. So down here, these leaves are kind of look burnt and curled up. That would be a sign of a problem with potassium. And also here's the tips of the leaves. Now if you noticed with nitrogen, the whole leaf was turning yellow all the way. This one along the edges and the center is still green. So you see the little subtle difference between the two? That's usually a potassium problem, or it can be a salt problem. If you have too much salt in the soil, it'll do the same symptom here, and the edges will turn brown. So if you start seeing the, the deficiency symptom, you might have to test your soil to see whether it's a nutrient problem or whether it's a salt problem. Some of the other nutrients. How many have seen that on tomatoes? Yeah, yeah blossom end rot. And that's a calcium problem, or it can be if your fruit try to, if you get a set when you have real cool, damp conditions early in the spring, you could have the same problem. Part of that is that the tomato plant under a cool, damp, wet conditions, it has trouble taking up calcium. So you want to make sure you either have a lot of it, enough calcium in the soil, or sometimes you could spray the plants with the calcium. You had it. Going too dry will prevent the plant from getting enough calcium and can cause that. Okay. Going too dry can cause the same thing. Here's manganese. Notice the modeling of the leaf. See there's green and yellow, green and yellow kind of a pattern. That'll be, that's manganese. And let's see, here's the next one, iron. Now iron looks a little bit like nitrogen deficiency, but the iron affects the young leaves where with nitrogen it pulls it out of the old leaves. That's the difference between the two. The iron, the plant cannot move the iron. So when it runs out of iron, it shows up first in the young leaves. And you could, you could find uh, books that show all the different deficiency symptoms. 
So I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but just so you can see some of the pictures of what it looks like when you have a deficiency problem. Now you could have your soil tested. There's a lot of ways of doing that. You could get these little kits. These kits are fairly good. Um, the advantage of having it, they're fairly inexpensive and you get quick, quick results by using these little kits. Uh, you could test multiple times, so you could do a test, you could try some fertility stuff in your soil and then test again and test several times using these little kits. It's usually only for the major nutrients though, so if you have a problem with some of the other nutrients, like the micronutrients, the kit probably won't cover that. It usually does just nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Now you could also have a lab analysis done, usually by a private lab. Now some states will do testing for you. It's more expensive if you do it with a private lab. If you're fortunate enough to live in a state that'll test your soil for you, and some of the Midwestern states will do that, I don't think Idaho will do that, right? They don't have any soil test thing in Idaho that I, nobody here, okay, if they did, everyone would probably know. So I'm gonna assume Idaho doesn't have it either. But if you have to pay for it to be done, it's a little more expensive. But you could have complete tests done, usually with very detailed recommendations. And there, there are sources, places you could have your soil tested. For example, if any of you have ever heard of Peaceful Valley Farm Supply, uh, they have a, a soil test. I think it's $90 uh, to have your soil tested. And I had my soil tested the first time because I wanted to see what I was getting into. And the nice thing about this company is I wanted to grow things organically and they structure their tests so that it tells you what is in the soil, not just the nutrients, but the organic material and some other things. So they test it with that in mind. A lot of places will just test as if you're going to be using chemical fertilizers. So this is one place. There are other places that test that you can have your soil testing done, do similar type of work. Some will specialize in organic gardening, like I just mentioned with this uh, catalog. So how do you read a fertilizer label? Go get fertilizer. The numbers on the bag refer to the percent of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, always in that order. So uh, I have here a, a label from a bag, and it says 322. And it says vegan mix. This is an organic mix, and it has no animal products in it. Uh, by the way, you could get uh, vegan mixes if, if you're concerned with things like, uh, what's that thing going on? The, mad cow yeah, mad cow disease and things like that. Or if you're concerned with, uh, you know, they, they give animals a lot of antibiotics and things like that. So if you don't want that in your soil, then you can get a vegan mix that's all plant-based. Or if you're fortunate and you know somebody uh, that has animals and you know how they raise them, you could use certain animal products in your soil safely. Like, for example, uh, I know Mrs. Woods has, has her chickens, and I, she feeds them carefully. She knows what she gives them. See, I wouldn't hesitate if I was needed to use some chicken manure, you know, if she was going to give any up. You know, I could go ask her for some chicken manure. I wouldn't feel bad about using that because I know what that's, what that's coming from. Those are healthy, good animals. But this, if you notice, it says 322. That's the amount of uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The three would be nitrogen, 3% nitrogen. Well, let's put it up here. So here we have a bag, a 10-pound bag of, let's say, 5, 10, 10. That would be 5% nitrogen. That would be 10% phosphorus as P2O5, and 10% potassium as K2O. And that's how they calculate it. And so if you do a soil test and it says you need a certain amount of these nutrients, you could calculate uh, how much of that nutrient is in the bag. So in this case, in this bag, a 10-pound bag, you would have a half a pound of nitrogen. And you would have one pound of phosphorus and a pound of potassium. And if it says add a pound of potassium to a certain length of bed, you could get a bag of fertilizer and know how to calculate that out. Um, this is actually fairly easy if you get 10-pound bags because any of you that pay tithe, you can usually calculate, you know, 5 and 10% is easy to calculate, right? At least I find it to be. Okay, chemical or organic fertilizers. 
What's the difference? Does it really matter? That's the question I hear. So I want to do some comparison here. And let's talk about Eden for just a moment. We are not told in the Bible how the plants got their nutrients in the Garden of Eden before sin. But I'm going to guess, or I'm going to stick my foot out and say that it probably did not result from death. There was no death before sin, correct? So however they got their nutrients, it didn't involve death. That's, that would be my guess. Now, the Bible does say that there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. I had one teacher that said that he thought that mist had nutrients in it, some sort of nutrients, and so the plants would get their nutrients. We aren't told, so it's just a guess. But like I said, I don't believe it involved any sort of death. Now, what happens in nature? Okay, we have a tree in nature. And nutrients are taken up by that tree, by the root system, all right? Then what happens over time? A leaf falls off that tree. That tree has shed something, the leaf dies. Now, if you think about it, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, right? And really, that's all that sin gives us. Sin gives us death, but we're not walking around in leaves, dead leaves, because although sin gave us death, God worked into the system a means of breaking that dead leaf down and returning it to the soil. There's a cycling that takes place. There are organisms that take that dead leaf and break it down, and the nutrients are released back into the soil so the tree can take it up and its roots go out and get new nutrients, and it continues to grow. Now, what happens in the garden? We have a carrot here. This is not one that I planted, all right? <laughs> this is a healthy-looking carrot. No. And, of course, it takes up nutrients. But what happens? We go out and we harvest that carrot, and where do those nutrients go? They go to our home, and from there they go to the trash or to the dump. And the difference between chemical and organic fertilizers are that organic tries to recycle in the, the, into the garden what takes place in nature. It tries to duplicate that procedure, all right? It takes the nutrients from somewhere in this line and cycles it back, whether as compost or uh, manure or whatever it might be, where with chemical fertilizers, it tries to replace those same nutrients using chemical salts. So if you boil it down to the difference between the two, that's the main difference between organic and chemical fertilizers. Organic tries to kind of duplicate that recycling that takes place in nature, where with chemicals, they replace those same nutrients using salts, chemical salts, right? Potassium nitrate, this and that. There's a lot of these different salts they use. But it goes beyond this. Now, by the way, there's a problem with salts. Abimelech fought against the city all that day, and he took the city and slew the people that was therein and beat down the city and sowed it with what? Why did he do that? So nothing would grow. And that typically is a problem with using chemical fertilizers is that over time, the plant draws the nutrients out that it wants and needs but there is a salt residue that is often left behind, and so you get a slow buildup of salts in the soil. And not all salts are bad, but over time you end up getting some of these salts that are not good for the plant building up in the soil, and then you have to deal with those salts. Comparisons. I'm gonna show a little difference here between chemical fertilizer and organic fertilizer. The form applied, again, is salt here for chemical. With organic fertilizers, it's organic material and ground rock. The nutrient release with chemicals, it's usually by dissolving. You add water, the water in the soil dissolves the salt, and the nutrient becomes available. With organic, it's usually bacterial action that releases the nutrient. The nutrients are released a lot slower with an organic fertilizer, and oftentimes the release 
is temperature dependent. So when it warms up in the spring, you get a quicker release because the bacteria are working. And then in the fall, when it cools down, they release less nutrients because it's cooling off and they're not working as much. Availability, with chemicals you get immediate availability, which is good sometimes if you need that. With organic it's gradual and you have to keep that in mind if you're going to use organic fertilizers. The philosophy, and there's a big difference between the philosophy of using these two. With the chemicals it's to replace nutrients and with organic it, the philosophy is to build up soil fertility. I worked with a, uh, a gentleman from Israel who developed a website, he was really into avocados and he developed this website and you could go on this website and tell him I have an acre of avocados and my crop is I'm getting 200 pounds of avocados per tree and he, you could plug this into the website and it would tell you exactly what the nutrients used by that tree so that you could put those nutrients back in. It was a replacement idea. The tree is taking this much out, you put this much back in. That's, that's the uh, outlook or that's the way a chemical uh, farmer or gardener looks at it. You're just replacing what the plant uses. With organic, you want to build up the soil fertility. So let's look at some sources of these nutrients, organic nutrients. If you need nitrogen, and somebody was asking me about, nitro, uh, about organic fertilizer, if you need nitrogen, there's fish emulsion, bat guano, feather meal, cotton seed meal. Now, by the way, recently I've kind of started to stay away from sources that are not clean, meaning uh, the bat is not a, a clean animal in the Bible, so I don't use bat guano anymore, but I'm not trying to force any, that idea on any of you. It's just something that I've kind of been toying with recently, and I've found ways around it, so I don't do it. But these are different sources of and cottonseed meal is a vegetable source of nitrogen, and it has a slow release. With phosphorus, there's uh, soft phosphate bone meal and phosphate rock, and you see there's different release rates for these. And potassium, you could use wood ashes. You have to be a little careful using wood ashes. Don't use very much of it, and make sure that it's, uh, you know how you have the ashes can be real uh, dark or can be real light. If you get a real good burn, you want to use the, the lighter ash, not the real dark ash that, from a poor burn. But you want to use the, the good light ash from a good burn. All right? And don't want to use a lot because it will alkaline, it will make your soil very alkaline. Uh, kelp meal is another good one. I, uh, there's a fellow that goes to the Orofino church that he goes and buys his kelp meal from a feed store and uh, big, buys a big bag of it and uses that. That, that sounds like a good idea to me. I'm going to try that sometime. Uh, crushed granite is another source of potassium. Green sand, which is green, green sand. It's, the name is very uh, descriptive. It's just a sand that's green and it's very slow release, but it's very good in uh, potassium. Building up the soil fertility. Now I want to show you how this works in your soil. How do you, what's the difference between organic and chemical? And if you're wanting to build the soil fertility, if you add an organic fertilizer to your soil, the first year, maybe only 50% of that nutrient, whatever it is you're trying to get, will be released by the bacteria in the soil. And the second year, another 25%, 15% the third year, and the fourth year, 5%. These numbers will vary depending upon what the nutrient is and the source. But I'm giving you an idea of what this means when you add a, an organic fertilizer to the soil. You don't get all the nutrients that first year. Now if in the second year you add that fertilizer again, you have to add these two and you end up with 75% of what you're looking for. And then you add nutrients, you add fertilizer again the third year and the fourth year. Now by, by the fourth year you're finally getting all the nutrients. Now, if something were to happen and you were to stop adding fertilizer in this fourth year, you would still have a residual release of nutrients for several years down the way. Do you see how that builds up the soil fertility? And then it, once it gets the soil to what it should be, it maintains that soil fertility for a length of time. Typically with a chemical fertilizer, if you add something like uh, miracle Grow or some of these chemical fertilizers, 
it's released by dissolving and it's immediately available and what the plant doesn't use, it's either leached out of the soil or it's lost. And so the next year you're adding it again and it's, it's kind of this immediately available and then it's gone. So it doesn't build up the soil fertility where this takes a little while, but it builds the soil fertility up and then it can maintain it for a period of time. Do you see, do you see what, I'm, uh, what I'm getting at here, how that works? Now, organic material also has another benefit in the soil, and I want to show you how nutrients are released in the soil to uh, kind of show you how, what, this, what organic material can do in the soil. If you have a particle of soil, that particle of soil will be surrounded by a real fine layer of water. It's called hydrostatic water. It's, it's microscopic, and it surrounds that particle of soil. And in that particle of soil, you have some nutrients. You can't, these are little Ks. This represents potassium, all right? That potassium is not available to the plant. It's part of the soil particle. It's, it's like part of the rock, so to speak. The only potassium that the plant can use is potassium that is in solution in this layer of water around that particle of soil. And there is a relationship between what is in the soil particle and what is dissolved in the water. It depends on the soil pH partly, but it can be 10 to 1, it can be 100 to 1, meaning there's 100 molecules of potassium unavailable in the soil for every one that's out in this water solution, okay? It, it changes with the type of nutrient and with the soil pH, but I'm trying to, this is this little bit of a scientific part and then we'll make it practical in just a moment. So with this soil particle, let's say that there's, there's two uh, potassium ions dissolved in the water and available to the plant to use. So what happens is a root comes down and it finds that potassium, the nutrient, and it absorbs it and it uses it. So it absorbs the potassium and transports it up. And then what happens is gradually, over time, since the root grabbed off a uh, potassium ion, the soil will release a little more potassium back into solution to make up for it. Because the ratio has been changed and it'll just slowly release a little bit into that moisture, the solution. Now when you add organic material to the soil, something interesting happens. See the, the little K, can you see the plus? The potassium, the ions have a, a slight charge to them, a positive charge. Organic material has a slight negative charge. Now you, have, have you ever played with magnets? Positive and negative, what happens? They attract each other, right? You, if it's a strong magnet, you, they click together and then you can't get them apart. So what happens is the organic material, which has a slight negative charge, it pulls those nutrients to it. So the potassium is now clinging onto the surface of the organic material and the, that interrupts the ratio here in the water and so this soil particle then will release more potassium to reestablish the ratio. So now we have two molecules of potassium here in the water and you have two stuck on the organic material. Now when the root comes down, notice instead of finding one molecule of potassium, it can potentially find three if it comes down this direction. Do you see that? So organic material, besides the fact that it makes the soil texture good and you get a release of nutrients from the organic material itself, it also makes nutrients that are in the soil more available by encouraging the soil to release those nutrients into the uh, into solution where the plant can get it. So even if, you, even if you don't organically garden, adding organic material to your soil has a lot of benefits. One of them is it makes your soil more fertile over time. Now there's an interesting verse in the Bible. I like this verse. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest thou shalt not reap, 
neither gathered the grapes of thy vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. So the Bible tells them the children of Israel were supposed to let their land rest every seventh year. Are you familiar with that? Now see, a scientist would read that and say, well, that's good agriculture. Because see, the soil during that year of rest is going to release nutrients, right? You're going to, you know, the plants have been for six years have been pulling nutrients out of the soil. And now in that year of rest, those nutrients will be released out of the particles of soil and into solution so that that eighth year then the soil will be more fertile. But the interesting thing is it didn't work that way. Leviticus 25, 20 and 21. And if ye shall say, what shall we eat the seventh year when the land is supposed to rest? Behold, we shall not sow nor gather our increase. Then I, and this is the Lord speaking, then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. The land was more fruitful the year before rather than the year after. There's no scientific explanation for that. It's a, just a pure miracle. It's a sign. God said, you be faithful and let the land rest, and I will bless you the year before you do it. Interesting how the Lord works sometimes to, to uh, confound science. Here's some questions to be answered. Why is it hard to switch to organic gardening? Why chemical fertilizer use became so big? What's the effect of soil pH? How to make compost? So I want to talk about why it's hard to switch to organic gardening. Now, again, we've, I try to, I'm going to give you a little bit of science with this, all right? It's just my nature, all right? But I want to make it practical too. So bear with me when we go through the science part, and I hope to make it practical afterwards. So there's some little maps with lines and stuff in your handout. We'll go through this, and hopefully when we're done, you'll understand uh, about the difference, the real difference between chemical and organic fertilizers and what is happening in the soil. So we're going to talk about nitrogen release, how microorganisms or how organisms work together to release nutrients. When you have organic material in the soil, so you know, say you've added compost or manure or something like that, what happens is that organic material cannot be used by the plant in that form. Something ha has to happen to that organic material in order for the plant to use it. And the first thing that happens is that organic material is broken down by aminization organisms into amino acids. Now, it's important to think about this. The amino acids are a waste product of these aminization organisms. Follow me? The aminization organisms break the organic material down and they give off as a waste product amino acids. The next step is you have ammonification organisms which take those amino acids almost instantly out of the soil and they break them down and give off ammonium ions. Again, that is a waste product for those organisms. Everyone follow me so far? Uh, you know, I don't mean for this to be scientific too much, but, but let's, we're, this is important, at least as far as I'm concerned. I, I consider this important. <laughs> All right. What happens to the ammonium ions is that they can be either lost to the air or they can be taken again by another type of organism, a nitrification organism, when there's oxygen in the soil, which is one reason why if you double dig the garden, you get a lot of nice oxygen in the soil. It really helps with this process. And these organisms make nitrate nitrogen. Now, nitrate nitrogen is the form that the plant can use. But several things can happen to nitrate nitrogen. For one thing, if you have a lack of oxygen in the soil, there's another group of organisms that can take that nitrate nitrogen and turn it back into ammonium, and it can be lost to the air, or it can make a big cycle here. And that's what often happens in soils that gets flooded. When the soil is flooded with water, you'll have the, the nitrogen going this way. And then when it dries out, it goes back this way, and you get this kind of a cycle take place. Another thing that can happen is it can get leached into your groundwater. This, this happened in Riverside. They sent out uh, 
where I used to live, they, when I was a kid, they sent out things in the newspaper and mail to everyone that said, don't drink the water, because they discovered that the nitrate that they had been adding to all the citrus groves had leached into the wells, and it was turning the babies blue. The babies would drink this water, and it would turn them blue, the nitrogen in the water. And so they told everyone not to drink the water, and then they had to switch us all over to city water. Anyway, so that happens. It can leach into the groundwater. Or the nitrate nitrogen can go into the plant, be taken up by the plant, and of course then when the plant dies, it becomes organic material and this cycle takes place all over again. So you have this kind of a natural cycling, you follow me, that takes place um, in the soil. And by the way, when you have a good thunderstorm and you smell that crisp smell, that's actually nitrogen being added, the nitrogen, when you have a flash of lightning, it's, it uh, creates nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen, that comes down in the rainwater and adds nitrogen to your soil. That's that nice smell you get after a, a thunder, lightning storm. Now the problem with chemical fertilizers is that chemical fertilizers are usually added in the form of nitrate nitrogen or ammonium. Now why that's a problem is, let's say that it's added as ammonium. Ammonium is what to these organisms? It's a waste product. Now what happens to an organism when it's flooded and surrounded by its own waste product? If we, if, if we were to close this building up and make sure it was airtight, we give off a waste product, carbon dioxide. And what happens if we were to be surrounded by too much carbon dioxide? Yeah, we would suffocate. And so over time, this doesn't happen immediately, but over time, these organisms, surrounded by their own waste product, start dying off. And then this starts to build up in the soil, and these organisms are affected. So you have in the soil a natural system that breaks organic material down, and when you add chemical fertilizers to the soil, it disrupts that, which is why a lot of times when a uh, so when somebody farms, let's say he has a large farm, and he uses chemical fertilizers and he tests his soil, it'll come back high in organic material. And he'll say, well, my soil is high in organic material. Well, yeah, because it, it sits here and it can't break down. See, the organisms needed to break that organic material down have been killed off. Not all of them, not 100% but a large percentage of them so that organic material is in the soil, but it just sits there. Okay, does everyone, all right. We're gonna, we're gonna show the ramifications of this in, uh, in a little more detail in just a moment. Okay, so why did chemical fertilizer become so big? Keep in mind what we've just discussed because it plays a part in this. So what happened to our farmers? This started back in the 1800s, 1803 to, to 1873. There was a man named Justice von Liebig. He was called the father of chemical fertilizers. And he advocated in a lot of papers and, and journals and so forth that soil fertility be, can be maintained by chemical fertilizers alone. And he did some studies and, and it sounded reasonable the first fertilizer used to a large extent was nitrogen. He really advocated using nitrogen. Now, nitrogen is one of the few chemicals that is not part of a soil molecule. You know, phosphorus, potassium, the micronutrients are all part of a soil particle and can be released. But nitrogen in the soil, it's either organic material or when it's released, it can go somewhere. If you remember that drawing earlier, it can be lost to the air or leached into the groundwater. It doesn't stay in the soil. So nitrogen is usually the problem in most soils. And the first farmers, the first fertilizer they used was nitrogen. And usually what you end up with is an immediate yield boost. Because most soils are low in nitrogen. So the farmer, now if you can imagine, this is the 1800s, and farmers do not have a lot of money, but here and there there would be a farmer who would have enough money to go down and try one of these new chemical fertilizers. They just came out with the nitrogen fertilizer and he would spend a little extra of his hard-earned money, would buy a chemical fertilizer, nitrogen, would put it on his 
soil and he would get an immediate result. The plants would be nice and green, beautiful looking. And keep in mind that the organisms that break down the organic material in the soil, they're not killed off immediately. So you, you still have these organisms releasing nitrogen plus this additional nitrogen he's added. And of course, all the neighbors would see that. And this farmer would bring home an extra crop. He'd have a little extra money. He could buy some things for his wife, you know, for his children, some extra clothing. That's noticed by farmers. You know, that's noticed by neighbors. When, when you do well, your neighbors notice it, right? So you have a yield increase, and the farmers noticed it. But then over time, continuing to add nitrogen fertilizer, what's happening to those organisms in the soil? They're being killed off, so they're not releasing as much nitrogen. Follow me? They're not doing the work because they've been killed off. So the farmer needs to add a little extra nitrogen to make up for what the organisms are no longer releasing. Do you see where I'm going? All right. So the farmer has to add a little more nitrogen. What happens next? When you have too much nitrogen in the soil, if you're not careful, and see, we tend to do this with a lot of things. If a little is good, a lot would do a little better, you know, more is better. We tend to add a little too much of things. And here and there, a farmer would add too much nitrogen. The plants would grow too tall. They would fall over. You'd get lodging. That's a problem where they, they go together. You'd have insect and disease problems because they get this succulent growth. Of course, Justice von Liebig came back and said, well, there's a solution to that. You need to add phosphorus and potassium to balance out the nitrogen. So the farmers, I mean, they had success adding nitrogen, so they said, okay, well, we'll add some phosphorus and potassium, chemical phosphorus, chemical potassium to our soil. Now there's a problem with phosphorus fertilizer. It disrupts the organisms making sulfur available. Now sulfur deficiencies were not seen very often until they started adding chemical fertilizers, and all of a sudden sulfur deficiencies showed up. So now the farmer has to add some sulfur, all right? You add sulfur and that makes the nitrogen organisms that are still in the soil, it disrupts them even more. So you had a bigger problem with nitrogen by adding sulfur. And then you have a yield drop. More nitrogen deficiencies show up. More nitrogen is added by the farmer. Farmers are trapped because it's hard to go back. The organisms that were in the soil that could release the nutrients have been killed off. And it's really hard. They, they gradually found themselves into this thing, and once they got too far in, it's hard to go back. It is very hard to switch from a chemical farm back to an organic farm. It takes several years to reestablish those organisms in the soil and the natural system to release things. Um, it's, it's, it's sad because they kind of slipped into it and then how do you get out? Some of, you, some of you probably are familiar with this because this happens not just in gardening and not just in farming, but this happens in the medical field. You start taking, you know, my mom has a condition where, where she can't breathe. And so she, they put her on one medicine and, and that had a side effect. So she had to take another pill to counteract that side effect and then something else. And, and now she has a, a whole handful of stuff she has to take every day all tracing back to that original pill that, that's supposed to help her. Feeding the plants with chemical fertilizers like feeding a person intravenously. You bypass the soil's digestive system. The soil is only used as a chemical reservoir and an anchor for the plant roots. The farmer or gardener who tries to switch back, the soil cannot digest properly. And so if you, those of you in this room that, that uh, are choosing how you're going to fertilize your plants. There is a place and a time for using chemical fertilizers, just like there's a time and a place for using other products. You know, maybe it's a medicine or whatever it might be. You know, I use chemical fertilizers for potted plants where you don't have this natural soil digestion going on anyway. Um, and occasionally if I have a problem in the soil, I might use something temporarily. Again, it's, it's not that initial 
application of fertilizer, it's continual use of it that, that is so deadly. I can remember as a youth, my parents used to tell me about smoking. Never, never, never smoke. Well, like a young person, uh, they brought a cigarette by and I took one puff. And oh, I thought, oh, my life is ruined. But you know, one puff, that's all I've ever had in my entire life. And uh, you know, that probably has no effect. But if I continue to use it, there's an accumulation of effect that takes place over time, or can. And it's the same way. If you're going to use chemical fertilizers, realize what, that's, what the potential of what that's going to do to your soil. Be aware of that. And there are ways of carefully using chemicals if you're going to use them. Better yet, don't use them at all. You can use good organic sources of nutrients and, and not have this problem at all. What about soil pH? If you have alkaline soil, that's usually found in areas of low rainfall. This is not always true. And, and there's an area in Riverside where we have little rain, and yet it's a very acid soil. If you have a pH that's high, 8. By the way, the pH scale goes from um, 1 to uh, 14, with 7 in the middle being uh, neutral. If it's 8 or above, it's considered alkaline. If it's uh, below 7, it's considered acid. To make the soil less alkaline, you want to add soil sulfur, manure, cottonseed meal, or compost. Those are some things that will bring the pH of the soil down, make it more acid. If you have acid soil, that's usually found in high rainfall areas. If the pH is 5.5 or below, the availability of calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus decreases, and other nutrients can become toxic. Now, there are some plants that can tolerate that, your azaleas and blueberries and things like that. But most of your normal garden crops need to have a pH above 5.5. To make the soil less acid or more alkaline, you can add dolomite lime, uh, wood ashes, or compost. By the way, do you notice something in common with both lists here? Compost is on both. Compost is a very unique substance, if you can make enough of it, it tends to bring the pH into the middle and then it acts like a buffering agent to keep it there. So compost is, very, it, for me, compost is kind of like gold. It's hard to make it, you can never get enough of it, and it just does miracles in the soil. And uh, I used to do a lot of work trying to keep my compost going, and uh, I'm, I'm learning how to compost up here. What's the best pH? Now, if you're going to use chemical fertilizers, you want your pH to be around 6.8. If you are an organic gardener, your pH can actually be a little lower, 6.5. The nutrients will still be available, again, due to the organic material and its action in the soil. You can have a lower pH, and it's still good for the crops. And this is a real nice looking uh, compost. Now, there's two types of uh, decomposition. You have anaerobic. This is without oxygen. And let's talk a little bit about this anaerobic method. This is very slow. It takes months to get a final product. It produces a rich compost. It has a very foul odor. And if any of you have ever made compost and you start getting real bad smell out of your compost pile, more than likely the pile has shrunken down and the middle of it's gone anaerobic. And I was told by somebody that's in the health profession that anaerobic diseases have a, a foul odor. Now, I can't speak to that. I'm not a health person. But anaerobic organisms evidently put off a very bad odor. Temperature. The anaerobic method does not produce heat. So it's a, it's a cool method. Now you have your aerobic method, which uses oxygen, needs oxygen. It's a fast method, you can have finished compost in just 21 days if you chop your material up real small and, and tumble it or, or add oxygen to it on a regular basis. Odor, it doesn't smell bad if it's done right, depending upon what you put in it. If you put uh, your coal crops in, it'll have like a sulfur smell, rotten egg smell maybe, but uh, most of the things you put in there, you're not going to get a real bad smell. It kind of has an earthy smell. It'll generate heat up to 160 degrees Fahrenheit or even higher. There used to be people that would, back in the old days, they would put a coil in their compost pile and preheat the water coming into their house using compost. Now you might ask me, why would anyone use an anaerobic method to make compost? Well, 
sometimes if people have a limited amount of space, you don't want to make a big compost pile out in your backyard, you can take a, a garbage uh, a tin, pail, a garbage can, big one, and you line it with the industrial uh, plastic liners that they have, the plastic bags that are thicker, and you put all your stuff in it, and you put a twist tie on it, seal it up, put the lid on it, put the date on a piece of paper, and then you wait, you know, eight months or so. And when you open it up, if it still smells really bad, you close it up and let it go a little longer. You can just sit this out on your back porch and just let it go. So somebody that has a small amount of space, but they want to make a compost pile, they can do it anaerobically. And uh, if you take and dig a big ditch and put stuff in the bottom of the ditch and then cover it up, that'll decompose anaerobically. A methane digester that produces methane gas is a good anaerobic composter. And then the sludge, when you clean the, com the digester, the sludge is good composter. Okay, f for the tape, I'll just say that um, it was mentioned that a methane digester is a good anaerobic digester and when you're done it has the sludge that can be used as a compost in your garden. So I want to show you or talk a little bit about an aerobic pile because this is the type of compost pile most people make. You need to have air for faster decomposition. Moisture it needs to be kind of like a wet sponge. Height, four to six feet, and this is where most people have trouble making an aerobic pile is they don't make them big enough. It's hard to get all the materials together to make one four to six feet tall, but if you can do it, it'll be good compost when you're done. Bacteria is supplied by soil and plants. By the way, people ask me occasionally, they have in catalogs, they'll have this, it's called bacteria starter, and they want to, they want to sell it to you for you know, 20, 30, 40 dollars. Well, everything that's needed to decompose your organic material is already found in the soil and in plants. So you don't need to buy that starter more than one time. If you ever buy it just one time and then throw a little of your old compost into your new compost pile, it's kind of like the thing about making yogurt. You take a little bit of yogurt and put it in to make more or, or something like that. So you shouldn't have to buy bacteria. And then you want the organic material to be, to have a carbon nitrogen ratio of either 10 to 1 all the way up to 25 to 1. Now, somebody was paid a lot of money to figure this out at some university. And you may say, well, how do I make sure that my compost pile has the right carbon nitrogen ratio? Well, I'm going to show you how to do that. It's a recipe, just like if you're going to cook something, you know, you follow a recipe and it turns out, well, there are recipes for compost piles, believe it or not. And I'm going to give you two recipes. But first, we'll talk about carbon sources and nitrogen sources. Here are some carbon sources. Dried leaves, wood chips, straw, uh, organic material that is not green, you know, typically dried. Uh, those are good carbon sources. Now your nitrogen sources would be things like your manures, chicken manure, uh, kitchen scraps, Hair actually is a good nitrogen source, but there's two warnings with hair. One is um, it's better not to use colored hair that's been dyed, all right? And second of all, be sure you don't let it mat because hair tends to want to mat. It forms a mat, and so it won't decompose properly if it's all matted together. Uh, green organic material, flowers. Men, if you're walking towards your organic pile with a bouquet of flowers, and your wife says, oh, honey, is that for me? Just say, yes, dear, and give them to her. Her happiness is worth more than compost. <laughs> Believe me. But it does make a good nitrogen source. So now the recipe for making compost. And on the left, I'm going to have the biodynamic pile. This is, this is the compost pile that's advocated by this book, which uh, I talked to you a little bit about earlier. And they loosen the soil first down at the bottom, and then they add a, a layer of stalks, whether it's corn stalks or weed, anything that has a, a fairly good sized stalk to it. The idea is that the air is able to permeate into this compost pile. And then you add a layer of dried carbon source. And then you add a layer of green nitrogen source. 
and the two layers are of equal depth. So if you're doing six inches of one, you do six inches of the other. Eight inches of carbon source, if it's dried leaves or wood chips, whatever it might be, then you do eight inches of a nitrogen source. You, know, you might use some uh, weed clippings or flowers, <laughs> something like that, okay? And you continue to build your pile and you put some soil on here because the biodynamic pile, according to their recipe, you don't turn it and it tends to go anaerobic in the middle, so you don't want a bunch of smell. So you put a lot of soil on it, and you keep building it until it's done, and you cover the whole thing up with soil. Now there's another pile. It's the indoor pile. Now this was developed by a man, an uh, English man, who went to India, and he wanted to develop for the people of India a method of uh, increasing the fertility of their soil using materials that they had at hand. All right, but he didn't want it to be named after himself. I mean, you don't want to compost, you know, the Stottlemyre pile, it just doesn't have a ring to it. <laughs> so he named it after Indoor India. All right, it's a town in India, I believe. And so that's the name of this compost pile. So you start with six inches of dry, then you add three inches of manure. Manure is your nitrogen source. And if you notice, the layer of manure is thinner than the layer of green material. This compost pile on the left, the biodynamic pile, uses green material as its nitrogen source. It's not as rich as manure, so it needs to be thicker. The indoor pile uses manure, which is a richer nitrogen source, so you don't need as much of it. And you continue to build it up. You use an eighth of an inch of soil. You keep building this compost pile. In this case, it's a very quickly made one and you cover it up with soil. And their compost pile, they would leave it flat because um, the idea was it was supposed to catch rainwater uh, to supply water for the decomposition. So if you were to make a compost pile to get the right carbon nitrogen ratio, you can use either one of these or a mixture of the two. And I've done, I've done both and I've done the mixture too. If, you add, if you're gonna add a little manure, it, the layer doesn't need to be as thick as if you're gonna use a green material as your nitrogen source. But if you make a compost pile using either one of these recipes or something in between, you're gonna end up with the right carbon nitrogen ratio and you'll end up with good compost. Okay, now here's a quote from Selected Messages. It says, while we were in Australia, we adopted the plan of digging deep trenches and filling them with dressing that would create good soil. This is using an anaerobic method. This was done in Australia. This we did in the cultivation of tomatoes, oranges, lemons, peaches, and grapes. And this was back in the 1800s, and they understood this principle of increasing the fertility of the soil by using compost material. Now there's a lot of different types of composters. You don't have to have an ugly looking compost pile in your backyard if you don't want to. Here's one that's made out of some plastic and it has slats in it so that the air can get in. You could build something like that or like this. If I, I wanna build something like this in my backyard and I wanna have three sections because I typically turn my pile twice. So I would start, I would build one here on the, the left out of the picture, I would start my pile and then after about a month and a half, I would turn it into here and let it decompose for another maybe month or so. Then I would turn it into this section. And at that point, after about maybe a month, it would be ready to use. The more you turn it, the faster it goes. Now here's one for a small, uh, like somebody that has an apartment or something, you just add materials to the top of this. And the idea is it decomposes, it's black, it's small, so it's not gonna generate a lot of heat, but it's black, so the sun will heat it up and do some of that work for you and decompose the material quicker, and then you pull the finished compost out of the bottom. Here's an easy way to add air to your compost pile is to uh, get one of these type of systems or make one. I made one with a, a 55 gallon metal drum and I had my grandfather, he, he knew how to weld and do stuff, and so he cut a door in it and put hinges on it. And then I would go outside and just turn the thing. And you'd load it up with stuff. Now this is nice because it has two sections. You can have one section where the compost is finished and the other where it's being made. And work your way and when one is done, then you start on the other and you're always filling it up and always using the compost in it. And if you go out and turn it, 
with the little handle. And they even make some, by the way, that have little motors on them. I mean, if you really want to get fancy. Anyway, that, so that's, if you turn it, you can have finished compost. If you chop your materials up small, the compost can be done in 20, 21 days. Now you could do earthworm composting. You need some sort of a container. The earthworms need to stay dark. Um, they don't like it to be very deep. So two by three and maybe two feet high needs to be dark. Here's a mixture that you don't have to use. This is one that uses manure. But there are other recipes. You can go on the internet and get different recipes for using earthworm. This one uses manure and a little bit of soil. <clears throat> the earthworms you use are the red fishing worms. By the way, again, some of these catalogs will try to sell you special super earthworms. All you need to do is go in a bait store and just get the red earthworm. Those are the, those are the same thing, but they don't charge you an arm and a leg and call them special, you know, compost earthworms. They call them fishing worms, and so you don't pay so much for them. But it's the same thing, all right? Don't, don't be paying for expensive earthworms. And it can be done in 60 days. They make a real nice compost, by the way. Um, I've done this, did this down in Riverside, and uh, the finished compost is real nice and has a good texture to it. And the earthworms, by the way, they take material through their system, I guess you could call it, and it actually helps to release nutrients as well. So the material ends up to be uh, richer than if you just made it compost straight without the worms. Now here's one that you can buy where you start at the bottom and the bottom section here is to collect moisture and you get what's called a compost tea out of it. And then the earthworms, you, you put a layer of material in there and the earthworms start working on it. You put another layer and the earthworms, when they finish with one layer, they work their way up. And so the finished compost will be on the bottom and you just, you lift up the next two sections, you use the material in here and then you put it on top and start adding your kitchen greens and whatever and the earthworms just work their way up decomposing as they go and you just keep switching it. You don't have to be that fancy. This is meat ministry and uh, the director of meat ministry, this is in Tennessee, he didn't particularly like these old uh, refrigerators but they're insulated and so uh, what's his name again? Brad. Brad. Yeah, Brad Neal. Yeah, Brad. Oh, I'll just call him Brad. I can't hear the last name. But Brad, he, uh, he gutted the, uh, all the parts out of the refrigerator and then put some holes in it for drainage. And it's insulated so that the worms didn't get too cold. And inside, he had a nice compost down there. And they, the meat ministry is a, is a health area. And they, they did a lot of greens and, and uh, sprouts and stuff. And whatever the people didn't use to make their different juices and stuff, Whatever was left over, he threw it down in here. This is wheatgrass, I believe, and uh, earthworms would decompose it. And then they had this nice finished uh, decomposed material that, that uh, they would use in the garden. And he also hooked it up so the, the refrigerators were at a slight angle, and uh, he put a little tube on it so the compost tea, the liquid, he collected in a container down at the bottom. And so he had that he could use in his garden as well. How do you use compost? Boy, compost is excellent to be used in a lot of different ways. It's ready when it has a dark, rich look. You can apply it any time if you screen out the large pieces. It's best if you can have one-third of your final soil mix, organic material like compost. So you would work in two inches of compost, six inches deep. I'll tell you, it's hard to get that much compost. <laughs> I was fortunate if I could put maybe an inch on and I was happy. I was really happy and my plants were happy too. And when you're done, again, your garden will look like this, this time. <laughs> again, that's just a picture off the internet. Now, I have a little short video here at the end that shows composting. Let's see. There it is. Now, I have a compost pile here that's being built. This is one that I've just turned and one that's almost done. This is my final compost pile. I've turned it a couple of times and it's ready to be used. And I have a screen over here leaning up against the wall with uh, half inch holes in it. And that's what I screen my compost with because anything that's larger than half inch, I just put that in my next compost pile to continue decomposing. So in a moment here, I'm running this camera by myself. So I had to zoom and do all that and then run over there and try to act like 
So here I am. You can see there's still some material left in there that hasn't completely <coughs> decomposed. But I'm screening it, and anything that doesn't go through the screen goes into my next compost pile. Make sure it goes through. And this is a short clip, by the way. It's almost over. And there is my finished compost, and that is nice stuff. Okay. Oh, we have a question back here. When I tried to compost up here in Idaho, um, it's too cold for it to really do much through the winter. And in the summer, by the time it's ready to use, my plants are already growing. Do you put it on after the plants are growing? Yeah, you can put it on as a, uh, as a mulch and as a side dressing. Yes, it's excellent for that. Do you have any comments about the Wilson compost? No, I'm not familiar. Does anybody here have any comments? Yeah. About they complain so much about bad smell. And I was tested uh, a week or so ago. My God, it does have a bad smell. And mm. uh, so it's supposed to be turning it. Yeah, probably they may not be turning it. She's talking about the uh, smell from a composter place. Where is it located? Lewiston. Lewiston. It's on the bypass road that stays. Oh, the right yeah. The river. Okay. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> now, now, see, they had, a, they had a compost system in Riverside where it was a big, huge, long tube, and it was constantly turning. And so they would dump the stuff. They would grind it. They had a grinder type thing at one end, and they would dump it in, and it would just work its way. It took a couple of days for it to work its way through that tube. But because it was constantly turning, it was constantly being, uh, you know, fused with oxygen, so it decomposed really quickly, it didn't give off much of a bad smell, and then people could come, and I think they did it by weight. You would weigh, and then they put it in, and then they could get finished compost the same day and take it back to their garden. Real nice setup. There are some places that do that. I don't what if our neighbors, if they're, if they're here, uh, use compost from that facility? But I've heard that they have heavy metals That may be the case. You know, you do have to be careful of heavy metals, especially if they use uh, certain waste products in their compost. Then you might end up with heavy metals, and that's not good. You don't want that in your garden. Okay, do we, if, how are we doing on our time? Oh, I have another comment. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Did, CEO. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. We're going to go out to the garden. You're going to watch me double dig. I've also read that the, like the has, you have to be careful because it has salt. salt. It has a lot of salt. Steer manure has quite a bit of salt, so you do have to be careful with using it. Well, that pretty much leach out by itself. That can leach out, but if you're putting that in your garden on a regular basis, the salts will build up if you're not careful. Now, down here, it's probably less of, here it's probably less of a problem when you get a lot of rain because yeah, the rain is so good at leaching. But see, in California, where we have salt in our water already, and you're trying to leach, you're putting salt in your bed, and then you're putting salty water on, and then you end up with a the problem. There was a hand back here. What do you do about, I mean, does grass clippings make good uh, salt? Yes, grass clippings, but you don't want to put them on too thick. And if you put them in your compost pile, make sure they don't mat, because they tend to mat, and then you get anaerobic and you smell. But if you mix it in, or, you know, and, it, and weeds will chop up fine, you know, that's, that's excellent. Well, I, I can only tell you about my property. It was acid. Everywhere I checked, it was acid. There's a real spot up here. Because most of woodland has alkaline soil. You know, it's very interesting. I'll, I'll just a little sidelight. Uh, when, I, when I was doing my research in, in, at the university, um, I was researching some trees that grow only seven places in the entire world, and, and four of those places are down in California. In just little areas, you walk up and here's this grove of trees. And come to find out, they like acid soil, and all the soil around is alkaline, and here you have a little area of acid soil, and there those, those trees are. And they'll be 100 miles with not a single tree, and then another grove of trees. And then you'll have 50 miles, and then a grove of trees, just where the acid soil is.
gypsum that yeah. breaks the soil up yeah. if you have clay soil. I don't know about the salt. Question? Uh, what about leaves from the forest that put under the water? Um, or do you make them Leaves make excellent, is an ex excellent carbon source. Now, if you're using pine needles, that's, uh, that will acidify things. Um, Huh? Well, don't you put in your I don't put any. Uh, I don't put any uh, manures that come from like a dog or a cat. I don't put anything that's poisonous in my compost pile. Avoid aluminum foil. Yeah. What about maple leaves? Maple leaves, I think, would be good. Yeah. Even if they rotted and not fresh. Yeah. No. When they're dried, the leaves make a good compost. Oh, and they're they're still green off the tree. No, no, no. But once they're dried, then they're a good carbon source in there. Do they dry out after they've fallen? I mean, ours yeah, once they turn brown, they're considered a carbon source. It, even if they're wet, like if it rains or something, that that doesn't make a difference. It's it, it's the fact that they're a carbon source. Once they're dried and they've fallen off your off the tree, is they're there, a carbon source. Is there a tree leaf that you would want in it? That you would not want in it? Well, if, if it's poisonous, I wouldn't put it in there, but no, most of them would go in. Like I said, I would be careful with pine trees, unless you're trying to acidify your soil. If you're going to grow uh, blueberries or something, I wouldn't necessarily use pine needles, but most of the other trees are excellent. You were talking about going easy on putting cow manure in your composting. What about... Steer manure is high in salt. What about chicken manure? Chicken manure is even higher in nitrogen than cow manure. It's a very good nitrogen source. You have to be, and it's best to put chicken manure, if you're going to use it, put it through your compost pile because if you try to use it directly in your garden, you can burn your plants. It's so high in nitrogen. But it's a very good nitrogen source for your compost pile. So you could sprinkle it on your garden and then really till it in? You could do that too, yeah. Just be, just, just be careful and not put too much of it in your garden because of the nitrogen. It is very high in nitrogen and it, it, you know, chemical fertilizers, you have to be careful because they can burn your crops. Well, there are some organic fertilizers where it's the same problem and you can have that with chicken manure because it is so high in nitrogen. Yeah. Are you going to be talking about uh, plant nutrition relative to soil fertility? Not a lot, um, no. Do you think there's an effect? Well, I believe there is, yes. They, you know, I think the issue that you're referring to is that they say the uh, plants nowadays do not have the nutrition, the vitamins and so forth in them as they did years ago because of what's happening to our soil. Um, and to some extent, I believe that is true. They are showing that. However, it's also true that if you grow plants organically and are treating the soil properly, the plants that you grow on the, that soil should be nutritious like the plants 100 and 200 years ago, especially since you can still get the same seed that they were growing two and 300 years ago from, from places like uh, Baker Seed that I I showed you the catalog where they have all these heirloom varieties. You can be growing the exact same varieties that they, our great grandparents were growing. And if the soil is being treated right, you can get the same nutrition out of those plants that they did. The flavoring to me is just so much better than the heirloom fruit. Yeah. Now, now, I will mention one thing with, with heirlooms. I, I do always a mix because the heirlooms, it's a, I have found, and it may not be as true up here as it was down in California, but the heirlooms tend to be a little more touchy as to their growing requirements. And so sometimes you'll plant an heirloom variety and it just won't like it. I guess that's the best way to put it, and so it doesn't do well. And so I'll plant a few um, you know, hybrids that I know do well so that I know I have a crop, but I'm, I'm planting heirlooms too, and I keep track of which ones do well because I want to gradually get away from using certain varieties and use more of the heirlooms. Is there, I, I understand that the hybrids won't reproduce from the True. seeds. True. 
They will reproduce, but they won't be true to the variety. So if you take a hybrid and you plant the seed, you'll have all kinds of, of the mix of the original parents that went into that hybrid will, will be found in your garden, whatever that might be. And there are some hybrids where if you plant the seed, it won't germinate because they put a terminator gene in there. That's not very common with vegetable seeds, but on a larger commercial scale, they are doing that. Well, I understand that, they, that they're doing something so you can't reproduce for the time. You know, they don't want people to be able to grow their own food. Yeah, I've heard rumors about that, and I can't, I, I, that I can't really because there is comment on. Because we can't buy ourselves, so we'll need to grow. We'll need to be able to save our own seed. When I grew up back east, they had a lot of alfalfa fields that they would plow in to, to improve the soil. Exactly. So here, since I've not been successful very well with um, composting, I've been putting alfalfa pellets on my garden. Is oh, that excellent. Just is that just adding too much nitrogen, or is that a no, good no, 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 that's, that's great. And, and probably most of you, well, hopefully you all know that uh, legumes, like your alfalfa, your beans, your peas, they can all fix nitrogen, not the plant itself, but the organisms that are associated. They have little root nodules, and the organisms, the bacteria that are in those root nodules can actually take nitrogen out of the air and fix it into a form that the plant can then use and the, the bean or the alfalfa can use that nitrogen, and then when you turn that into the soil, it goes into the soil, so it enriches your soil with nitrogen, too. Yeah. 